Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. Think you know the Brooks Ghost? Think again. Introducing the all new, better than ever Ghost 16. Now with nitrogen infused cushioning for lightweight, supreme softness that feels good every step, every street, every single day. So go ahead, take your daily joyride in the all new nitrogen infused Ghost 16. It'll turn your everyday miles into everyday endorphins. Let's run there. Head to brooksrunning.com to learn more. Hello, hello. Welcome back to Peak Northwest, an outdoors and travel podcast by the Oregonian and Oregon Live, dedicated to the adventure and exploration of our beautiful Pacific Northwest. I'm Jamie Hale. And I'm Vicki Connor. Together, we take you to some of the most beautiful and interesting destinations in our region, discussing where to go, what to do, and places to see. And today, we're headed back to the tide pools of the Oregon coast for a few low tide adventures. That's right, Vicki. We are now smack in the middle of what I like to call low tide season on the Oregon coast. And look, I know that there's like always low tides in the Oregon coast. It's just how the ocean works. But summer is really the best time to go out and explore all of the sea caves, the weird tide pools, and some of the other low tide treasures you can find along the coast. Plus, you know, the weather is a little bit nicer, so Mm -hmm. hopefully you're not getting caught in any rainy conditions when you're out there. Exactly. Um, So, man, I really, like, haven't done a lot of low tide, like, exploring or anything, so I'm excited to get into this. It's an interesting, like, adventure to do because it's, like, these – I mean, I'm, I'm obsessed with, like, the intertidal areas, like, you know, where it's, like, you know, partially underwater and partially in the air and these animals that live there like thrive both on land and in the water and there's like some of the weirdest creatures down there the anemones that have their like you know neon green tentacles but then like Mm. pucker up when they're exposed to the air and of course all the sea stars and the tiny little crabs and the urchins and like all the weird little bugs and the shrimps and the gooseneck barnacles i mean i could really go on um I could we could do a whole episode about a whole episode about the gooseneck barnacles and how weird those guys are. <laughs> but you get to see all this stuff, um, not to mention some of these like really cool landforms and other things out there. Because I think, like, you know, for various reasons, I think these these places we're going to talk about today are very cool. But it, it's this uh, world that is partially exposed for a lot of the year or for like a lot of the parts of the day that all of a sudden is uncovered. And we get to go explore it. Like that's so cool and weird. I feel like I I need to download an app to help me with like the tides and the times and everything. Cause it's just like out of sight, out of mind type of deal. But if I make an actual effort to like look and see when to go, then I I could see myself just like being out there for ever. Well, I guess not ever because of the tides, but <laughs> comes you know. back in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would spend a lot of time out and exploring. Well, I can help you out, Vicky. Okay. Um, that's what this episode's all about. <laughs> that's what it's about. Um, so during the summer, there are these periods of exceptionally low tide, where usually where it gets like down close to or below um, two feet, which is pretty big. That's a lot. Um, that's kind of what you're looking for if you want to do these low tide adventures. So um, there are by... You know, my my look at the tide tables from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, um, which is a great resource if you're looking for tide tables. Um, these five time periods, um, one has already passed, June 5 to 8th, but we have coming up June 23 to 24, July 5 to 6, July 21 to 23, and August 20th to 21st. So those are some good opportunities to go out to the low tides. Of course, if you're going to go do it, check the tide tables before you go. You can do it th- like through NOAA if you want to see like the official, you know, government tide tables, or you can just like Google tide tables for wherever you're going to be on the coast and you can find them pretty easily. 
um, you want to go out typically when the tide is not at its lowest, but when it's receding. Mm -hmm. So that you kind of walk out there with the tide so that you're going out and doing your exploring before it's all the way back up. <laughs> yeah. I've had, you know, like one or two occasions in my life where I've been out in the tide pools in these like intertidal areas a little too long and have had to like clomp my way, you know, or like rock hop my way back in a really kind of dicey situation. And you just don't want to be there. You want to make sure you're really timing it right. Yes. When we're talking about these low tide adventures, we want you to have fun and uh, not to get hurt in any way. So any other words of, of caution for people before we get into this? It's really all about the footing with a lot of these places. You've got to have a good pair of shoes. Don't go out there in flip flops. Do not go out there in flip flops. <laughs> Don't go out there in like, you know, just regular. You want, you want shoes that have a nice sole that are waterproof, ideally. Like I go in like my waterproof boots um, that I wear usually like in the wintertime. Um, these are oftentimes like sharp, slippery rocks that you're navigating. So like I like to kind of go low to the ground, ready to sort of like go onto all fours if I need to. Um, you just really want to make sure you watch your foot and you keep your balance. There's also a lot of things that out there that are alive that you don't want to step on. Yeah. Like we said, the anemones are out there, the sea stars, there's a bunch of barnacles. Um, the general rule of thumb is to step on rock when you can. And if you can't step on rock and you got to walk over some like crusty barnacles or something, just like really quickly get over them. Um, but you, I don't want to disturb these intertidal creatures as, you know, if you, if you can help it. So it's all about just watching your footing. So that takes a lot more time than like taking a walk down the beach. So I, I always add in extra time if I'm going through these intertidal areas, just because I know I got to walk slow. I got to pick my way carefully and, you know, and plus some time to, to see whatever you're going to see and to properly enjoy that as well. Absolutely. Well, where should we get started with uh, this summer's adventures? So I've got uh, a list of eight low tide treasures that I want to go through. And I've organized these from like the easiest to access to the hardest to access. So if you're someone who's new to this kind of thing, maybe start at the top of the list. And if you're someone who like is a low tide explorer, um, we've got some great stuff at the end for you to check out. Cool. All right. So let's kick it off. What's what's number one? Number one is just, I wouldn't say tide pools generally. They're all over the place. We don't have to get too deep into it. We've done episodes here. You can go find them in the archives. There's a lot of tide pools and they're super easy to go to. You're looking for pockets uh, of, you know, of like rocky area where you can just sort of walk right up to them. You can take a peek inside, maybe walk around the little rocks. You can, you know, take a look at all the, the various creatures that are in there. Um, I think this is like a super good entry point. It's a great point for kids if you want to take them in and just like show them like, hey, want to check out this really cool, weird world and see some like aliens. Um, it's a great way to get them into that ecosystem. And it's a great way for anyone to sort of learn about what this ecosystem is like. So tide pools, find them, get out there, um, and you can just have a great time. Any specific place or this is just like anywhere there are tide pools <laughs> this first one is just like generally tide pools but if you want yeah. if you want some specifics i mean off the top of my head here like i mean yahats has some great tide pools um all along the shoreline there um seal rock um that state park there has some really good accessible like family friendly tide pools um haystack rock great tide pools at haystack rock too um, there's, they're really all over the place. Uh, anywhere you've got a little bit of rock, rocky shore, you can find tide pools. All right. What's up next? Next we have, this is one of my favorites. I love that this is like number two and so accessible. <laughs> the ghost forest of Neskowin. Oh, um, this sounds spooky. cool. <laughs> um, have you, do you know about the ghost forest, Vicky? I feel like, um, I've, I've seen one of our video producers made something on the ghost forest, like years back, but I don't mm -hmm. know too much about it. The ghost forest is the remnants of an old Sitka spruce forest yeah. that uh, it was thought to have been buried uh, during a massive earthquake 2000 years ago, possibly a Cascadia sub subduction zone earthquake. So oh. what it looks like today is you, you walk onto the beach at Neskowin at low tide and you kind of go to the south end of the beach. So Proposal Rock is right there kind of the center of the beach. 
and you go left, you walk down towards uh, the end of the beach there. And um, you see all these like old ancient stumps just kind of like and like snags rising up out of the sand. So it's this weird, creepy uh, ghost. I mean, they call it ghost forest. It's a great name, honestly. And like on these like sort of like these stumps carved by like the water and by time, you have like a lot of like sea stars and creatures that are like, you know, dug into and burrowed into these little cavities in them. Um, it's very weird and cool. Yeah. This, I feel like the video that I saw, there's like a, a deep fog that had rolled in onto, onto this area and it just looks so eerie. This is like spooky tide pooling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The ghost tourist is a vibe and the vibe is definitely spooky. <laughs> when I was there um, the first time, it was similar. It was very sort of foggy morning. Um, and as I walked up to the ghost forest, the fog began to clear and they had kind of like that, like faint blue and golden light coming through. Mm-hmm. And like all of the, the, the stumps were like in silhouette, um, and you know, proposal rock in the distance that's a kind of cloaked in mist. It was just so cool. <laughs> and this is like super easy to get to. There's like a small, you know, beachside stream you've got to like walk through, but anyone can do this. If you're like staying in Nesquin, if you want to stop off in the morning, for one of one of these low tides, you can just walk right up to this. Amazing. All right. So this one, again, a little bit easier access to this mm-hmm. as well. Family friendly, good to go. And Nesquin's a great beach too. I, I That's that's the beach I grew up going to. Mm. Um, and I just, I love it there. All right. What comes after the ghost forest? After the ghost forest, we're, we're sticking with the drama here and we're going to go <laughs> with Thor's Well. Whoa, this is a good one. So Thor's well, it's so a lot of the Oregon coastline is this um, basalt, volcanic rock basalt uh, that gets carved over time from the ocean in various weird ways. That's one of the reasons you have all of these chasms and spouting horns and sea caves and such. So Thor's well is like a, a circular bowl carved out of the basalt um, that has access underneath. So the ocean kind of goes up from underneath and then up through this hole. So it kind of creates this really interesting effect where the ocean kind of comes up through the hole in the shoreline and sprays up. Um, and people like to get it sort of at um, high tide sometimes, like when the tide is coming up and you can see the water coming up and filling out and then draining back down. And it seems to kind of like fill and drain endlessly. Yeah. Um, at low tide, you can kind of go up and see down into it a little bit more, which is what I like to do. Um, of course, obviously, be careful. Um, <laughs> I, <was about> to <laughs> say. I talked to the U.S. Forest Service once who manages that area, and um, they say, you know, no one's like fallen in and died in Thor's well to their their knowledge, but like people fall there all the time because this is like this is like one of those those things that's on like roadside America that people like know about from social media. So this is a classic spot for people to show up in flip flops, um, walk out there on this like really sharp and dangerous basalt rock. It is no joke. Um, if you trip and fall out there or slip and fall, you're cutting yourself up. So again, just have a, a good pair of shoes, a decent pair of shoes. Just really all you need is a decent pair of shoes and a little bit of caution and you're going to be totally fine. Um, but be careful. Don't fall into Thor as well. That sounds like not a fun time. No, (laughs) (laughs) like a mystical, uh, a mystical bad experience. Like no one wants to fall into Thor's well. That sounds you get transported to another universe. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Oh man, Jamie, this episode is your like anti flip flop campaign. Oh my gosh. But for good reason. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Um, next one up, if I recall, if my geography skills are serving me right, is not too far from Thor as well. Devil's Punch Bowl. Well, uh, it depends on your definition of n- not so far. Um, it's definitely a drive. <laughs> so Thor's Well, and we should have perhaps said this in Thor's Well. Thor's Well is just south of Yahats, um, in Cape Perpetua National Scenic Area. Um, Devil's Punch Bowl is is uh, also on the central coast, but it's up there um, south of Depot Bay. So yeah, it's not so far. It's not driving length the coast, but it's it's in the same general region. 
Um, Devil's Punch Bowl is um, another sort of circular bowl carved out of the, the shoreline, but instead of basalt, it is sandstone. And it's huge. It's it's very large. It's like a cavern. If you imagine like a sea cave, but the whole roof is is missing. Um, and it's just sky. That's like what Devil's Punch Bowl is like. Um, it's incredible. It's really, really nice. Um, this is a spot that you can see from a viewpoint just above it. So it's right there at um, Otter Crest Beach, which is also a really nice beach. If you ever want to stay in that area, the inn at Otter Crest, which is right there, is a really cool hotel. And Otter Crest Beach is like excellent, excellent stuff. So Devil's Punch Bowl is at one end of that beach. And um, like I said, right above it is a um, Devil's Punch Bowl State Natural Area viewpoint that if you go like when it's storming out, it's a really cool storm watching spot. Um, it's like up on the cliffs. It's kind of safe. It's really easy. You can see the, the ocean kind of rushing into Devil's Punch Bowl. Um, again, similar to Thor as well, but much bigger. Uh, but when it's low tide, you can go down to the beach and walk into it, which is a really cool experience. Do you, are there any like sea creatures or anything in there? Not that I saw. Okay. It was mostly just rocks. Um, yeah. A bunch of like smooth sandstone rocks, um, which I mean, as a person who likes rocks, there are some really cool rocks in there. Um, but uh, yeah, not otherwise. No, it's just sort of a big empty space. Mm. Well, as far as you know, there could have been a sea creature hiding in the, somewhere. <laughs> I, yeah, I was in there for like 20 minutes. Uh, and there, that place has, has had, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands. I don't know how many years of existence. So I'm sure there's been some stuff that's happened in there. Some creatures hanging out in there. Um, definitely some fun things. I mean, you never know what you're going to find when you're out there. Yeah, for sure. All right. Next up, we got... Secret Beach. Secret Beach. Now, we've talked about Secret Beach a lot, and I think recently, so I don't know that we need to get so into it. Um, for those who haven't heard or don't remember, Secret Beach is a beach in the Samuel Boardman Corridor on the southern Oregon coast. Um, it's a great beach. We haven't talked about it specifically as a low tide beach, but it is one of those ones you want to get to like when the tide is low generally. like I wouldn't go there in a high tide because it's a very sort of short, uh, narrow beach. Yeah. Um, when the tide is out, you can get into mu you can explore it much, much more easily. Um, so there's a couple of sea caves there, at least one sea cave that I know of there on the beach that you can, that you can see, um, when it's low tide, a couple of places you can poke your head into, but it's just such a beautiful place. I mean, Vicki, you, you've been to secret beach, right? I have. And I wish I could go back and like spend some more time. Cause I was trying to like cram so much into a short period of time on my trip, but, um, and like, even with it being cloudy and like not the most picturesque weather, I was still blown away by Secret Beach. Yeah. Spending time there, right? I feel the same. I, I, I go there and I take a few pictures and I leave. But like I, every time I'm there, I'm like, I want to spend more time here. Yes. Yeah. So we, we have, we have this down a little bit lower on the list of, uh, you know, harder to access because getting down to Secret Beach requires a little bit of like clambering down some rock. Um, it's like not so hard. I've seen children do it. Um, but it is something that like, if you have mobility issues, it's going to be really hard to do. Yeah. So everything up until now is like a, a fairly easy, a little bit of wobbly footing situation, but getting down to secret beach is just a little bit, a little bit trickier. Yeah. Plus depending on where you park, you could have like a little bit of a hike to get there as well. Yes. Yeah. That's a good point. We should mention, um, the parking for secret beach is weird. Um, it's like an unmarked pullout on the side of the highway. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I, again, if, if any state parks folks are listening, I implore you to do something about the secret beach parking because it's <laughs> crazy. It's like up against a guardrail and it's just, it's not great. Um, and he, like the signed official parking lot leads you down a trail that people get lost down, yeah. fall off the cliffs and people just like, it's not, it's, it's not, a, not good news. So do your homework. We've got posts on Oregon live about how to get to secret beach, you know, take a look at those, um, before you go. Yes. All right. Um, well, secret beach is a bit further from Portland, uh, compared to this next one, which is, uh, Haystack Rock. Haystack Rock. I know people um, 
don't always think about Haystack Rock as like a low tide specific attraction because it's something people look at usually from afar. Uh, but it is a great place to go at low tide. There's like so many good tide pools and cool attractions around Haystack Rock. And when the tide is really far out, like it's going to be on those dates we mentioned at the top of the episode, you have the chance to walk around Haystack Rock, like to circumnavigate it, which is just a cool thing to do. I've not done that myself. That's like sort of next on my low tide bucket list is to do the circumnavigation of Haystack Rock. Um, but it's very cool. Uh, again, we're talking about some more like, cause you're going farther out into like the, the ocean or what is normally the ocean. You've got a lot of like slippery rocks out there. So this is where this is a little bit higher on the difficulty scale because you just, there's a little bit more to navigate there. Um, so just keep that in mind if you want to go to Haystack Rock, but and this is a great one to do if you want to, you know, have all the other amenities of Cannon Beach. Um, you can go walk around Haystack Rock, then go have like, you know, uh, breakfast at Lazy Susan. You know, oh, yeah. it's, a, it's a great, a great place to have so much more to do than just a low tide attraction. And uh, I think one of the best uh, examples of what you should not do, aka getting stuck out there, don't be like a cougar and get stuck <laughs> on Haystack Rock. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. Don't climb Haystack Rock. <laughs> Interesting that just as a, as a tangent here, I read a story in the Oregonian archives about um, a time when they had to blast a chunk of Haystack Rock off because people kept climbing up it to like check out the nesting seabirds. There's like a ledge that people kept climbing and so they had to blast a chunk off of it to stop people from doing it. But the my people word. doing the blasting ended up getting stuck on Haystack Rock when the <laughs> tide came in and they were like stranded up there for like a day or whatever, like, you know, the, until the low tide came back in. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Do you know when this was? This was 1968. Okay. This happened. Okay. Um, we've got like a, a picture in the archives of like, you know, the dynamite explosion and, um, <laughs> And it's just a, a, a wild, wild story. I love digging the archives and finding this stuff. Like I was just like, yeah. what have we written about Haystack Rock back in the 60s? And you see, <laughs> you just find these things. It's really fun. All right. Um, we got two more on our list. Yes. Uh, Boiler Bay Boiler. The Boiler of Boiler Bay. Vicky, do you know this story? The Boiler no, of Boiler Bay? I okay. don't. So Boiler Bay is a bay in, in um, Depot Bay. Uh just north of Depot Bay. It's like uh, known as a really good spot to go whale watching. Um, there's a pull out there um, with a restroom. Uh, it's just a, a, a nice little spot on sort of this really rocky section of coast. It got its name when uh, a steamboat um, going up the coastline, I, the, the, I believe the engine room caught on fire and it like careened ashore and then like crashed into the rocks and exploded. Oh my God. Everyone got off. Okay. But like, the the wreckage went like everywhere is the story and like while most of it was collected and scrapped the the ship's boiler itself um sank uh in sort of like the inland part of the shore and is still there to this day so when the tide is is really low you can clamber around on the rocks out there and get to the boiler of boiler bay <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> also, like, so a bunch of other parts, like, you know, were there and they cleaned those up, but then they're like, we're going to leave the boiler. I imagine it's very heavy. It's uh, heavy. It's big. And it's out there. Like, uh, it's not easy to get to. You, you'd really have, like, if you were to collect it these days, you'd have to, like, take it apart or, like, get a helicopter or something. Oh, my gosh. It's, like, so in crazy. the rocks in this low tide area. Um it, it getting out there is a little tricky. Um, that's why it's this far down the list because it takes some really tricky footing. Um, when I went out there uh, a number of years ago, it, I remember there just being a lot of really, really slippery rocks and a lot of like small, shallow pools that I did not want to like dunk my whole foot in. <laughs> so it was a lot of sort of like navigation, uh, like slippery navigation to get out there, but it wasn't too far of a walk and it's a little hard to sort of find. Um, it's kind of hard to explain, but there's a, a little pullout just north of like the Boiler Bay main state park pullout. And it, it's like a room for like a couple of cars. It's like this unmarked pullout. So it's 
a little a little iffy. But if there's yeah. space there and you can park safely, there's a little kind of rough trail that goes down to like the rocks, and then you can just kind of walk up. If you're walking down that trail, it's kind of uh, to the north a little bit, um, to the northwest, and you can you know see at some point this big rusted boiler sitting there on the rocks. How crazy is that to like walk yeah. out and see like that piece of history of the Oregon coast? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I like I'm looking at a picture of it right now, and you know it's been there for so long, it's almost like camouflaged uh, with the surrounding rock nearby. Yeah, the rust colored rocks and yeah. uh, sea life around. Yeah. Wow. All right, we got one more on our list here. Uh, Jamie, what, what is this one that is, uh, hard to get to? I imagine. Hard to get to lost boy beach is the one. Um, it's a very cool spot. I remember when I, I went there to write a story about it and ended up not writing a story about it. Cause I was like, this is a little too dicey for like the everyday adventurer. Um, so this is if folks who know the Oceanside area, this is a beach that is between like Tunnel Beach, which is a beach that people can get to through a tunnel in the rock in Oceanside, um, and uh, Short Beach, which is uh, just below the Cape Mears Lighthouse. It's known for like a, you know, a wooden walkway, and there's like a little man-made waterfall on Short Beach. So between Short Beach and Tunnel Beach is Lost Boy Beach, and you can really only get to it at low tide. Uh, the sort of the lore behind the name is that allegedly some boys went out there and died, I think is, is the, the legend. I don't know if that's true or not, but you know, obviously that gives it some, you know, this dangerous allure to some people. Um, but the way to get there is at low tide, these, these super low tide days, you can go out to short beach and, um, walk down sort of South. You kind of have to like climb over some rocks and then like down some rocks. It's a lot of like, Again, slippery rock cliff clambering. So it really takes some delicate footwork. But once you get down there, um, there's this big like sea cave tunnel that you walk through. Um, and again, when the tide is up, this tunnel is like not a place you want to be, um, obviously. Uh, but it's really cool to walk through. It's like totally dark, but you can see the other side. Um, and it's like kind of drippy and echoey. And there's like all kinds of like, you know, tide pools on either side of it. Um, and you get to the other side of that tunnel, there's this other beach that is Lost Boy Beach. And um, the beach itself is perhaps unremarkable. It's just a beach. But that like trip through the tunnel is really what it's all about. It's really cool. So again, hard to get to, but that tunnel and, and getting out to this beach is a really interesting experience. Oh, wow. I feel like the name alone is just scaring me off a little bit. <laughs> I feel like I, I'm too much of a scaredy cat. Like I, I would think, Oh God, like the timetables are wrong this time around. And I'm going to get caught in this tunnel and be, <laughs> I'm going to be the lost girl at the lost boy beach. <laughs> well, I will tell you, uh, that the, the time I went to lost boy beach, I went there once and my plan was to see if I could get from Lost Boy Beach to Tunnel Beach. So essentially to walk from Short Beach to Tunnel Beach via Lost Boy Beach. So mm -hmm. um, I wasn't sure if anyone, if it was possible. It just looked like it could be done in the map. I wasn't sure. So yeah. I picked one of these low tide days. I went out there, um, hiked across Lost Boy Beach and you know walked around the rocks. And I, I found myself at Tunnel Beach about maybe 10 feet too high on like a rock cliff looking down at the beach. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, this is not the situation I would like to be in. Um, but at that point, walking back across Lost Boy Beach and up the cliffs to Short Beach, I was like, I'm running a little low on time. I would yeah. really have to hoof it to get back there. So I guess I'm faced with like jumping off of this rock onto the beach like and it was like just right where the the water was coming in so i was trying to time it to like not jump into the water but yeah. like right when it went out and i i this is a situation like i don't recommend and maybe i it, at this point in my life i would not do i would just like hoof it back or just put not put myself in this situation um so i did jump off the rock and i was fine my knee was a little sore 
Um, but like, I, I do not recommend trying to walk all the way around unless the tide is like crazy far out. Maybe you can do it, but don't put yourself in that situation. <laughs> like, yeah. um, you know, don't, don't try that one, but just going, going through the tunnel to Lost Wood Beach and back easy. You can do it with, with some good footwork and climbing on the rocks. Yeah. Wow. Well, eight of these treasures, you know, sprinkled all over the coast. Um, when you are out there at maybe just any of these, um, obviously we went over bring a good pair of shoes, something sturdy and stable, not the flip flops. What else are you bringing out here um, in these low tide adventures, Jamie? Not much. I would say don't bring too much stuff. If you can keep your hands free, that's ideal because again, you're on these the situations where you might need to fall forward or like catch your balance. I like to keep a low center of gravity, especially if I'm in these really slippery areas, just in case I need to fall. So I'm falling just like a you know a foot rather than like several feet. Um, bring a camera if you have one, but like you know, I just I'd say just bring your you know phone camera if that's good for you, um, and a good pair of shoes and you know some sun protection. Uh, but that's it. Don't bring a bunch of stuff. Just, just go out there and enjoy the experience and, um, try to make sure that you're able to be as safe as possible. For sure. Any other words of wisdom for people wanting to explore in the low tides? It's so cool. The, it, the this ecosystem is so fun and weird. I love it. Um, Rachel Carson did a really fun book about the intertidal area you can read. Um, there's just so many cool, weird creatures. So, um, take a bunch of pictures, uh, and like go back and read about them or read about them in advance and go see them. Um, like I, the smallest little snails can be so interesting the way that they like have like teeth to drill into rock or like the way that they like feed with their feet. Um, I mean, like there's a bunch of these little aliens that exist out there in this, this world that like, you know, we have no business being a part of, uh, but we get to go visit sometimes. So bringing a sense of curiosity, like I, I, I turn into a little kid every time I'm out there. So I'm just like, whoa, cool. What's that? Um, and I think that's a great way to go is just bring your sense of wonder and joy and you can have such a fun time out there. I was about to say, I feel like I, it taps into my inner child when I'm out mm -hmm. there and like I see a sea star and especially growing up on the East coast. I'm just like, Oh my gosh, how is, how I just like walk a few feet. And I see this. What is this life? Exactly. Exactly. Well, Vicki, I hope you're able to get out there and see something this year. As do I, uh, good thing I have, uh, eight great recommendations <laughs> right in front of me now. So I'm inspired. Uh, perfect. Well, folks, that will do it for us today. Until next time, you can watch our videos on the Oregonians YouTube channel and view all of our travel and outdoors coverage on OregonLive.com slash travel, as well as HereIsOregon.com. Please leave a rating or review if you enjoy the show. And if you want to support this podcast, as well as our local journalism, please consider a subscription to Oregon Live. You can find details at OregonLive.com slash pod support. Also, if you're a fan of the show and you're interested in potentially sponsoring it, you can get in touch with our marketing people at advertise at oregonian.com. This episode of the show was produced by me, Vicki Connor, alongside Jamie Hale. Stay safe and happy travels, everyone. Until next time, we leave you with this 10 seconds of Zen.